Hi there, welcome back to NBC's online review course. Um, we are now doing module 6.1 and we are going to talk about gastrointestinal disorders. So, digestion can be separated into two components, okay? We have our GI tract, which starts from the mouth, ends at the anus, and we have accessory structures that help the GI tract, like teeth, tongue, saliva, salivary glands, liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. We are going to discuss a whole bunch of things that can go wrong with this. So let's start from the top and move our way down. So we're going to start with dental and oral disease, starting in the oral cavity. Okay, so gingivitis or periodontal disease occurs when the gingiva, so the gums, become infected. It impacts all structures that hold the affected tooth. So the, if the gingiva becomes uh, inflamed and infected, it will affect the entire tooth. So let's start with gingivitis. It's caused by an accumulation of tartar. Um, the bacteria multiplies. And uh, what's really good about gingivitis, so just the redness that you see in the gums, it's actually reversible. No big deal. So you can actually just start taking care of the teeth, start brushing the teeth, and you can actually reverse this gingivitis back to a healthy mouth. Okay, so if you let it go and you don't take precautions to reverse it or prevent it, it will eventually turn to periodontitis, which is irreversible. So this is when there's so much damage done to the gingiva and the surrounding structures that there's no coming back from it. You're going to have a loss of root attachment. So um, down here, this will all let go down here, um, cause the alveolar bone to resorb. So this is the alveolar bone here. So eventually uh, with such bad infections and periodontitis, this, the body is actually going to start chewing away at it and taking it away. And eventually the tooth is just going to fall out. So the clinical signs of gingivitis and periodontal disease is halitosis, bad breath. A lot of people think it's normal for cats and dogs, so dog breath and whatever, but it, the only reason why they have bad breath is because of gingivitis or some sort of periodontal disease. Um, reluctance to chew, so it's really painful for them. They may be pawing at their mouth. You may actually see some nasal discharge. We're going to explain why that would happen later on. Increased salivation, maybe with blood. And you may also see some facial swelling. We'll explain that in a second. And also tooth loss. How do we diagnose it? Well, we look at the mouth. That's how easy it is. We just do an oral exam. Um, and we'd want to check the gingival sulcus. So this is just the, um, the in between the tooth and the gingiva, there's a little tiny space. Okay, when you floss, you're typically trying to get in there. And um, in cats, in dogs, you can measure it, and it should be about three millimeters or less. In cats, it should be about one millimeter or less. You actually use your dental probe to kind of go around each one of the teeth and see those pockets and see if they're within normal range. If not, then there's some kind of dental disease happening. How do we treat it? We do a dental cleaning. Maybe we need to do some extractions of some teeth that are just too far gone. We would want to do some antibiotics if there's some infection going going on and educate and I feel like this is so important um, educate clients on at-home care like fine as veterinary professionals you can bring us in we can take care of the problem we can remove all the rotten teeth we can give you antibiotics to get rid of the infection but the second that patient goes home again and starts eating plaque is going to start forming, tartar is going to start building, gingivitis is going to happen again. And the way that people need to look at it is that their cat or dog's mouth works no different than ours. We brush our, we should brush our teeth every day, twice a day, because we eat, right? So in the morning, we brush our teeth, get rid of all that plaque and tartar and bacteria. Um, and then we spend our day eating and the bacteria builds and builds and builds in our mouth. And then at the end of the day, we brush it again. So we're brushing away the bacteria and the plaque so that it doesn't cause irritation, infection, or eventually lead to periodontal disease. The cat and the dog's mouth works no different. And we really need these owners to understand that. Fine, you can bring them in. We can do what we can do in the clinic to take care of the situation. But 99% of the work on that animal's mouth is going to happen at home, okay? And um, we're going to talk about different methods of doing that, but 
brushing the teeth, nothing works better than that. Okay. And I think, and just think of humans, right? There's no way around it. You have to brush your teeth. This is the best way to prevent periodontal disease. This is the best way to scrub away the bacteria and the plaque. Okay, there's nothing that beats that. Luckily in animals, there's also dental diets that if, if the brushing doesn't work for you or the animal, um, that we have other options like dental diets, dental treats, dental chews, dental rinses. Anyways, we're going to talk about all those. But I feel like educating that client is so, so, so important. So um, again, we're going to tell that we're going to educate that owner. You need to begin this dental care as soon as possible, especially in the early puppy and kitten um the early puppy and kitten time because we can get them accustomed to the brushing, uh, brush the teeth, routine dental cleaning at a vet clinic, um, and treat gingivitis early. So if we can catch that gingivitis before it turns into periodontal disease, we can turn it back. We can bring it back and get that mouth nice and healthy. And then there's also dental diets, which act as um, similar to a toothbrush, not as good, but similar to a toothbrush and uh, it can help slow down the progression of periodontal disease. Okay, so oral neoplasms. So neo means neoplasm means gross, so, so it's a tumor, right? Any kind of tumor is called a neoplasm. Whether it's benign or malignant, a tumor is a neoplasm. So um, it's very common in dogs and cats to have oral neoplasms. The most common oral cancer that we'll see is malignant melanomas, which obviously the term malignant means cancerous, which is bad news bear, or squamous cell carcinomas. These are the two most common oral cancers seen. Um, we have to be careful not to confuse these tumors with papillomas. Papillomas are pale cauliflower um, like growths and they're just caused by a virus and they'll go away actually so um, but they can be surgically removed if necessary but they'll, they'll just go away on their own so do not confuse or try not to confuse a neoplasm with a papilloma malignant melanomas are rapidly growing and metastasize early to the lungs and lymph nodes so that's really bad lesions are often dome shaped and darkly pigmented and they completely invade the mucosa and the bone um, I've seen this quite a few times in patients over the years and it's just terrible. Um, the owners come in thinking that there's just progressed periodontal disease and we open the mouth and the whole jaw is just taken over by this very invasive tumor. Um, it, it creates um, a loss of attachment of the tooth. It's just uh, in the terrible smell. It's just very bad. And 99.9% and .9 of the time, the animal gets euthanized right then and there. So this right here is just to help you uh, see the difference between uh, something that could be malignant and something that could be benign in the oral cavity. This is a malignancy right here. So this is a growth here um, that is a malignant neoplasm. But again, take a look over here. Um, something that can happen in, especially in dogs, I don't think I've ever seen it in cats actually, uh, is gingival hyperplasia. Okay, so this is actually just the gingiva that's overgrown. Uh, very common in boxers actually. So this is just an increase in growth of the gingiva. It is completely benign, no big deal. A lot of the time we'll actually take a cautery machine and cauterize it down because it can get painful. Sometimes the gingiva can actually grow over the tooth and that's very painful while chewing. So we just kind of zap this off and bring it right down. No problem, it's not cancer, um, but not to be confused with this melanoma over here. This right here is a squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see that growth on uh, the upper palate here. Um, and uh, not to be confused with uh, papillomas, which are these things right here. Almost look like warts. So uh, clinical signs of the oral neoplasm, uh, mouth pain, salivation, lesions, halitosis, tooth loss. Uh, again, very similar signs to just periodontal disease. How do we diagnose it? We do histology of the tumor. So we'll take a biopsy of the tumor and we'll send it away to a histopathologist so they can take a look and tell us whether um, it's benign or malignant. We would also do an x-ray of the lungs to check for METs. Uh, when we say METs, it means uh, metastases. So just if it is a malignant tumor, has it spread 
through the body and made its way to the lungs. The lungs is typically one of the first places that will see tumors if the tumor, if the cancer has spread through the body. Um, so we call them METs and, they're, and it's basically taking an x-ray to look at the lungs to see if there's any tumors in there. If there are, we know that the cancer spread through the body and it's a very poor prognosis. We can also do some blood work. How do we treat it? We can surgically remove uh, the neoplasm and chemotherapy if, it's, if it is a malignancy. And uh, we tell the client very poor prognosis for these malignancies and obviously very good for benign. We just zap them off and we call it a day. Or if they're papillomas, they'll just go away on their own. But malignancies are very, very poor prognosis. Okay, so moving down from the oral cavity and we're gonna go down to the esophagus. So esophagitis, this is just inflammation of uh, the esophagus, and it's usually caused by something that's irritated it, okay? So like it's something acidic, drugs, or even hot material. If you've ever taken a sip of really hot tea or coffee and it just burns going down, okay, you can cause an esophagitis. Or if you take a Tylenol or some kind of medication and you didn't follow it with water and it kind of starts giving you almost like this heartburn feeling and it, it's kind of burning in your esophagus, that's esophagitis. So it's often associated with gastroesophageal reflux. So like, I guess that heartburn that I was just talking about can cause esophagitis as well when you have acid coming up from your stomach. Um, so it can cause esophagitis as well. Clinical signs, anorexia, they're not going to want to eat because it's so painful. Dysphagia, so even if they are eating, it's going to be very difficult for them. Excess salivation and regurgitation. And how do we diagnose this? Um, by endoscopy. So we'll take a camera and we'll go down the esophagus, just like in that picture that we saw in this last slide, um, and take a look at the esophagus. How do we treat it? I guess it depends on what's caused the esophagitis. Okay. So what if they've ingested an irritant, for example, we can't induce vomiting. We may administers we would want to administer something neutralizing like olive oil or activated charcoal uh, and this will neutralize the irritation or the acidity uh, check the product check product poison control so you would want to see uh, what is the proper treatment for that and no food or water um, by mouth for a few days if it is acid reflux, we would feed a high protein and low fat diet to normalize the gastric emptying. And we would use an acid reducing medication and a gastroprotectant because we don't want any ulcers to happen in the stomach either, right? So famotidine and sucralfate are two very common drugs used in acid reflux. What do we tell the owner? Obviously, prevent access to poison. I think every owner should be told that. Um, oftentimes, owners will warm up wet food in the microwave before giving it to the pet. You have to be really careful when doing that because when you take your finger and you touch a certain spot on that wet food after it's been microwaved, it may feel like a good temperature, but there may be some hot spots throughout that food. So the animal may eat it and actually burn as it goes down, causing esophagitis. So you'd wanna uh, cool it down and mix it really well before feeding. Um, treatment takes a while to be effective, and you also have to manage the pet's weight, which is gonna help with the acid reflux. Um, when very important for technicians or really anybody that's giving the animal uh, medication is when you pill a cat, make sure you wash it down with some water. A lot of the times cat will, cats will get esophagitis if they've been pilled and the pill gets stuck in their esophagus. So just take a syringe full of water, squirt it into the mouth, which just pushes that tablet down, uh, preventing um, esophagitis. Okay, what happens if we get an obstruction in our esophagus? So it, ca it obviously caused by ingesting a foreign object. Uh, prompt removal is vital for esophageal health. And what you're gonna see in that patient is exaggerated swallowing, salivation, retching, and anorexia. Um, we would take an endoscope and go down and visualize it. And sometimes um, with the endos, thanks to the endoscope or with the aid of the endoscope, we can grab onto that foreign bo body and remove it that way. And you can also take an x-ray to see it. How do we treat it? 
you want to remove, uh, you may be able to remove it through the mouth using the endoscope. Alternatively, the vet may even push it down because maybe it might do more damage if we rip it out through the mouth, right? So we may want to just continue its trajectory down to the stomach and then do um, a gastrotomy to remove it. We would want to fast the animal one or two days post-op to help the healing. And, uh, and when you do start feeding him, just feed him soft food because he's going to be quite irritated. Okay, let's go down to the stomach. Let's talk about acute gastritis. Um, this is the most common cause of vomiting. The root cause is usually because of diet, whether it's spoiled or maybe they changed the diet suddenly, or maybe even an allergy. Uh, it could be an infection, whether it's bacterial, viral, or parasitic. It could be a toxin, like a chemical or a certain plant that they ate or a drug or maybe they've ingested a foreign object and it's causing a gastritis. Clinical signs, anorexia, acute vomiting, dehydration, and painful abdomen. How do we diagnose it? We just do a physical exam and we can do some blood work just to rule out whether there's any other conditions. Um, a lot of the time that will come back normal. Um, and an x-ray. So how do we treat an acute gastritis? We can choose to fast for 24 hours and then feed a low fat diet. So when we recommend a low fat bland diet because of a gastritis, we, um, we often recommend boiled hamburger and rice. So you would take lean ground beef, boil it two or three times to get all the fat out of it. You'd be surprised how much fat is still in lean ground beef. So boil it two or three times to get all the fat out of it and then do a 50-50 mixture with the ground beef and the rice, cooked rice. And then you take little tiny meatballs of that and feed small amounts frequently. That is a good, bland, low-fat diet for that animal with gastritis. Um, if you don't have ground beef, for example, you can still use chicken. That's still a great protein source. Um, and if the owner doesn't want to do the hamburger and rice and do that cooking at home, they can always go into a vet clinic and just buy a gastro diet, which is formulated, uh, it's, it's formulated to be bland and low fat, still very palatable, um, but to help those animals out that have the gastritis or the gastroenteritis. If the animal is dehydrated, we may want to do some IV fluids and some antiemetics to help control the vomiting. So it's very important to educate the clients that we have to avoid sudden diet changes. We have to do kind of a transition over about a week's time. If the animal vomits two or three times, fast for 24 hours. If the vomiting persists, you should call a vet and try not to feed table scraps. It causes so many issues in dogs and cats. Okay. Um, immune-mediated inflammatory bowel disease. Now we talk about IBD throughout this PowerPoint when we talk about the stomach, when we talk about the small intestines, and when we talk about the bowels, the large intestines, because IBD can affect all three of these areas. So um, IBD is very common in cats, but often seen in dogs as well. Accumulation of inflammatory cells in the lining of the stomach, small intestine, and or large bowel. So the cause is not known. It's thought to be an intolerance to the gut flora, which is the normal bacteria found in your GI, um, or maybe an intolerance to the animal's diet. Clinical signs, chronic vomiting, weight loss, diarrhea, mucus in stool, and constipation even. Diagnosis, we could do a stool test just to rule out whether there's any kind of parasites or anything like that. We would do a chemistry, some blood work, to make sure that there's no other predisposing, or sorry, any other um, issues that are that's causing these symptoms. You may even want to biopsy the GI tract, which is a quite invasive route, but sometimes if you're just in there anyways, doing maybe an exploratory or something, you may want to do that to get your answer. How do we treat? We, st we treat with steroids, which act as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, we will put them on a hypoallergenic diet, a bland diet. We would use some probiotics to help increase GI health and maybe some other medications as well. 
So the diagnosis of IBT, IBD requires a complete lab workup because the possibility of another disease must be ruled out first. So all of these clinical signs may be clinical signs from another condition, right? So we have to rule everything out before we just assume that it's IBD. For a definitive diagnosis, we have to do that biopsy. But a lot of the time, it's quite invasive to do a surgery just to go get an intestinal biopsy. So a lot of the time, uh, we don't necessarily get a definitive diagnosis. You will need a special diet for life and perhaps medication for life. Um, and here's a video here describing IBD if you'd like to do some more research. Okay, continuing on with the stomach, we can get ulcers. So ulcers is actually a common result of drug therapy. So uh, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, anti for example, like ibuprofen, is an NSAID. It is the most common cause of stomach ulcers, both in pets and people. So the drug, including um, ASA or ibuprofen, like I said, uh, these aren't drugs that we typically use in animal medicine. Um, animal medicine NSAIDs would be like Medicam, for example, disrupts the normal mucosal barrier of the stomach. Now remember, the stomach has this thick mucosa that protects the lining of the stomach so that the stomach acid doesn't eat its own lining, right? So we have this mucosal barrier, but this, these NSAIDs actually disrupt that and then um, it results in an ulceration because of the acidity in the stomach. It will actually start chewing away at the stomach lining. So severe stress may also cause gastric ulcers. Clinical signs would be, a lot of the time, they can be asymptomatic. They could be vomiting blood, anemia, edema, melena, anorexia, and maybe even abdominal pain. This is what the gastric ulcer looks like here. Again, you can see the mucosa has been disrupted here and, um, and it's the acidity in the stomach actually just starts chewing away and that's what it looks like there. Very painful. We diagnose, we could do an x-ray or an endoscopy, like that picture that we just saw was an endoscopy. Treat with IV fluids if they're dehydrated, like if they've been vomiting and not anorexic and whatever. Uh, we would do no water or food by mouth. We would do sucralfate, which will coat the stomach, and antacids and other medications. Um, very important to tell a client not to give NSAIDs without consulting your veterinarian. If a veterinarian tells you to give the NSAID, then you should give it with a meal. Okay, uh, if the animal has a history of gastric disease, an antacid may also be given just to prevent the ulcer from happening. Okay, GDV. So everyone should be fairly familiar with this, gastric dilation with volvulus. Okay, you may also have just gastric dilation, which is bloat. Okay, so when the stomach fills with gas, but doesn't necessarily twist. If the stomach fills with gas and twists on itself, that's GDV, that's gastric dilation with volvulus, okay? Very commonly seen in large and giant breed dogs because they're deep chested. Usually happens after they've eaten a large meal and then they exercise. The stomach is similar to a bag with an opening on each end, right? The cardiac sphincter and the pyloric sphincter. Um, the stomach fills with air, food, or fluid, and then it can actually occlude the pyloric sphincter. So further dilation happens and it fills and it fills and it fills and then their patients get bloat. If they have bloat or gastric dilation with volvulus, that means that it fills so much with all this gas that it actually twists along its longitudinal axis. The gas-filled stomach can interfere with the movement of the diaphragm, making breathing very difficult, so oftentimes they're dyspneic. It can also block the blood flow back to the heart because of the portal vein in the vena cava. So it can actually pinch down on these veins, stopping and decreasing circulation. Signs of bloat uh, or GDV would be a bloating, right? Their abdomen's really large. Weakness and collapse. These patients are in critical condition by the time they come to you, typically. Non-productive retching, tachypnea or tachycardia, nausea, and hypersalivation. How do we diagnose it? We can take an x-ray and we want them, uh, we would want a right lateral abdomen and uh, it's the test of choice. Like you can see in this x-ray here, in the case of dilation with no volvulus, which means that it hasn't twisted, a distended, a distended gas-filled stomach will be visible. 
this is a radiograph of a dog with gastric, gastric dilation with volvulus. So that means the stomach has twisted on itself. The stomach is dilated, which is the large arrows, arrows that you see. Um, and there is a shelf of tissue, which is the small area, uh, arrows. And that just shows that the stomach is malpositioned. How do we treat it? We have to decompress that stomach as soon as possible, okay? So the gas is just filling and filling and filling and filling, and eventually it's just gonna burst, right? So we have to decompress the stomach as uh, fast as possible. Now, if we have um, dilation without the volvulus, so it hasn't twisted, we can actually take a stomach tube and just pass it down the esophagus because the stomach's not twisted. We could still have entryway into the stomach. If it's twisted, it's going to pinch off the cardiac sphincter and the pyloric sphincter. But if it's not twisted, we can get that stomach into the, uh, the tube into the stomach and then it'll just kind of deflate. Um, a lot of the times what we do need to do is trocarize. So um, there is something called a trocar, which there's going to be a picture of it in a second, used in large animal medicine. But a lot of small animal medicine hospitals and clinics don't necessarily have a trocar laying around. So you can take a large needle, usually 18 gauge, um, because I think everybody has 18 gauge, maybe even 14 gauge if you have it lying around, and then stab it into the stomach. Just right through the skin, just stab it and it's gonna deflate like a balloon. Um, and then you may wanna try the stomach tube again once you've deflated a little bit. This patient is going to be in shock, so he needs to be stabilized, okay? Um, and then once they're stabilized, you need to prep for surgical repair. So you'd go in um, and put the stomach back into its original position and do a gastropexy just to stabilize it in one place. The best preventative um, measure is a gastropexy, like I said, so you take the stomach and suture it onto the abdominal wall so it can't twist. A lot of the time, an uh, owners with standard poodles or Great Danes, large breed dogs that, is, that are just predisposed to this, during the spay or neuter, they may even ask the veterinarian to do a gastropexy just to prevent this from happening ever. Uh, feed small meals frequently and limit exercise after food. So this is a picture of a trocar. <clears throat> so you would puncture this into um, a dilated, uh, an animal with bloat, and it would release the gas very quickly. Okay, so continuing on with gastric issues, uh, neoplasia. You sh <laughs> you'll notice that we'll talk about, excuse me, neoplasia during any kind of system because you can get cancer anywhere, really. <laughs> But the gastric neoplasias are very common and often malignant, unfortunately. Most common neoplasia in dog is the adenocarcinoma, um, and in cats is the lymphosarcoma. Often gets diagnosed late, um, therefore very bad prognosis. Clinical signs, uh, mild symptoms like vomiting and weight loss. You would diagnose it by doing endoscopy and biopsy. You would treat surgical removal, but often it's progressed so far and it's metastasized through the body. So there's uh, there's usually no hope at that point. You could do chemotherapy. A lot of a lot of uh, clients tend not to do chemotherapy. I think in my 11 years, I saw maybe one person that under that put their dog through chemotherapy. For several reasons, it costs a lot of money, um, there's a lot of negative side effects, and also may just extend their life by a year or two, um, so a lot of people just choose not to. And um, the, the diagnosis is usually, um, sorry, the prognosis is usually guarded to poor depending on how quick you find it, and uh, eventually this cancer will be fatal. Moving from the stomach down to the small intestine. So acute diarrhea. This is the most common type of diarrhea seen in clinic. So my dog was fine and now all of a sudden he's got diarrhea. It's often caused by diet change. Maybe um, they're on a certain drug that's caused the diarrhea or maybe even just stress. Those are the three most common reasons for acute out of nowhere diarrhea. Clinical signs, sudden diarrhea, sometimes accompanied by vomiting and the patient is usually normal otherwise. 
How do we diagnose it? Um, we would have to rule out other causes of diarrhea. So we'd have to check for intestinal parasites or any kind of um, disease process that's going on. Uh, history and physical exam, again, fecal flotation to rule out any kind of parasites. And uh, we would want to do a hematocrit or some blood work just to monitor the hydration because with diarrhea, severe diarrhea cases, especially if they're not drinking a lot of water, can become de dehydrated. How do we treat if they are dehydrated? We will place them on fluids, uh, stop feeding for about 24 hours, uh, give them a lot of access to water because we don't want them to, to dehydrate it, to dehydrate, sorry. We could give Pepto-Bismol. Uh, we may be antibiotics uh, like metronidazole, especially if we assume that there's some kind of bacterial overgrowth going on and we would feed a bland low fat diet like that hamburger and rice or chicken and rice that I told you about. Parasitic diarrhea. So intestinal parasites often cause diarrhea, except for tapeworm. Tapeworm doesn't in dogs and cats, but roundworm and all the other ones typically do. Clinical, uh, how, how do we diagnose it with uh, the clinical signs? There may be blood in the feces, they may be vomiting, they may have some weight loss and a listless poor hair coat. We diagnose it by doing a fecal analysis and we treat it by giving it an antiparasitic. Viral diarrhea. Now, this is a sadder one. So the most co it's it's most common in young unvaccinated animals. The most common causes, the most com common viruses that cause viral diarrhea is parvovirus distemper, coronavirus, and feline panleukopenia. These are so dangerous. Um, there is no like antibiotics or any kind of meds that we can give that gets rid of a virus. I think everybody knows that you have to let a virus run its course. And unfortunately, without supportive care, most of these animals can die. Clinical signs, the diarrhea may be vomiting, anorexia, lethargic. Anybody that's seen a parvo puppy, like probably this puppy up here in this slide has parvovirus. It's very sad. They're just down and out. <clears throat> Diagnose, we do a blood test, so an ELISA test, which is a SNAP test that you see here, and uh, we, it'll test for a parvovirus. Um, there is no SNAP test for every single virus that may cause viral diarrhea, but parvo being one of the most common does. Um, and we just do supportive care. So we try to give them some antidiarrheal, we give them IV fluids to help them stay hydrated, antibiotics if there's like a secondary bacterial infection that's happened because of the virus. Again, we just do supportive care on these poor guys and keep them healthy until their body just sheds the virus finally. Uh, and, and the way that we prevent this uh, viral diarrhea or any of these viruses is just vaccinate. Um, these viruses that we mentioned are, are present in the DA2BP and the FERCP that we use to vaccinate our, our animals. So just vaccinate them. Um, you have to remember that these patients that are infected with the virus are immunosuppressed. So um, you have to be careful about their immune system being suppressed. The disease is gonna spread. Um, so you have to be careful and it's spread through feces. So make sure that you keep other dogs away, especially unvaccinated dogs, and make sure you clean up after, um, after the animal. Use proper cleaning techniques. Bleach uh, is a very familiar smell to anyone that's ever dealt with parvo or any of these viruses. You bleach everything just to make sure that you kill the virus and other animals don't get it. These uh, infected animals are going to be placed in isolation and uh, the prognosis depends on the virus. So parvovirus is about 50-50. So half of them will live, half of them will die. Prognosis is estimated based on the white blood cell count, so how low it is. And for feline panleukopenia, prognosis is guarded to poor and the coronavirus is, is usually good. Here's some videos here to help you out with these uh, viruses. Bacterial diarrhea caused by bacterial, which is, um, and but specifically pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so this isn't your normal, you would normally have bacteria in your GI, um, like in the gut flora, but this is pathogenic bacteria like Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter. These are very um, pathogenic bacteria, which causes symptoms like, like diarrhea. Clinical signs, diarrhea with or without blood. You may have a fever and maybe some anorexia. You would wanna rule out parasites. 
and tests, there are some tests available for some bacteria, uh, not E. coli, unfortunately. And we would treat with antibiotics and IV fluids if the patient's really dehydrated and debilitated. And we have to make sure, you have to be careful because if these patients do have a bacterial diarrhea, it can get spread to uh, the staff. So make sure you wear gloves and you wash your hands well and all that good stuff. <clears throat> so dietary intolerance diarrhea, this is actually quite common. It causes, it's caused by a sensitivity or an intolerance to certain diets. Another diagnosis of exclusion, we'd have to rule out other GI conditions before diagnosing it as a dietary issue. Intolerance is often to carbs, fat, or milk in commercial diets. If it's a sensitivity or an allergy, it can be anything, but usually it's actually the protein source. The condition can also be caused by the ingestion of foreign materials like tin foils, paper, rubber bands, right? So foreign bodies and um, clinical signs, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and weight loss. How do we diagnose it? Um, sometimes they just recently changed their diet. That would be to blame. Other diseases ruled out thanks to blood work and x-rays. We do a fecal analysis to see if there's any parasites. Uh, a lot of GI stuff, it's just, we have to rule out everything else before we just assume it is what it is, right? So we would do a fecal to check for parasites. We do a culture and sensitivity to see if there's pathogenic bacteria growing in there. And, um, you could also do a TLI test that's done in external labs, not in small practice. Uh, how do we treat exclusion diet trials? So you'd start changing the diet to see which one works best. You could give an oral steroid to help out with the inflammation that's going on in the GI. Very important to tell clients to keep them away from garbages because that's really going to cause um, some diarrhea. If the animal's on a hypoallergenic diet, the hypoallergenic treats may give, may be given to avoid sensitivity reactions. So don't put your animal on a hypoallergenic diet and then feed a whole bunch of treats and table scraps. That just defeats the purpose of the hypoallergenic diet. You go on that hypo diet and that is it. Okay. If you do want to give treats, you can give, you can buy hypoallergenic treats as well. Okay, chronic enteropathies. So chronic IBD is most common, most commonly lymphocytic plasmacytic enteritis. This is the infiltration of inflammatory cells, um, which causes damage to the intestinal mucosa and abnormal intestinal absorption. So the clinical signs of this is typically nonspecific, chronic and intermittent uh, vomiting and diarrhea. Um, you're gonna have increased gut sounds, so they're gonna making that the sound in the stomach flatulence, listlessness, weight loss, PUPD. How do we diagnose, diagnose this? The physical exam is usually unremarkable. Lab tests, um, we could do a CBC, fecal exam, intestinal biopsy. Again, we have to rule out everything else. Um, and then this is a picture here of taking a biopsy of that intestinal lining. How do we treat uh, with medication? We could do steroids, uh, antidiarrheals, intestinal protectants like sucralfate and antacids. With diet, we would want to limit the carb and lactose. Rice is a good is uh, a good carb for dogs. Uh, we'd want to restrict the fats, good quality protein. Vet diets are better for uh, for these than commercial diets. Um, and you can even try a hypoallergenic diet. So expect the treatment to be prolonged and expensive, and most cases are never cured, unfortunately. Okay. So moving down the GI, we have our final stop, which is the bowel, the large intestine. So IBD, again, we talked about it in the small intestine, we talked about it in the stomach, but it can also happen in the bowel. Inflammation causes decreased mucosal integrity, which decreases the ability to absorb water and increases bowel motility, causing more frequent watery bowel movements. Okay, so that's what IBD does to the bowel. You can have diarrhea, plus or minus blood, weight loss, tenesmus, which is just straining to have a bowel movement, and increased mucus. Diagnose blood work and fecal just to rule out any other cause for diarrhea. We can do an x-ray, which may show a dis uh, gas distended loop in the bowel. And we can also send it a biopsy to, for histopathology to see what's going on. How do we treat uh, with antibiotics if there's a pathogenic bacterial overgrowth, immune suppressors maybe, uh, diet, we can try a hypoallergenic diet or a low fat diet. 
So it's going to be long-term treatment. It's lifelong. Uh, treatment controls symptoms, uh, not necessarily the condition, and take the animal out often to defecate. All right, intussusception. Intussusception occurs when the proximal, the smaller part of the intestine, at the ileocecal, or sorry, the ileocolic junction. So this is where the small intestine meets the large intestine. Um, portion of the large bowel causes partial or complete blockage and compromises blood flow to that part of the bowel, which then causes necrosis. So it's actually basically the intestine sucking into itself. Okay, so as you can see in this picture here, um, part of the bowel has kind of sucked into itself, causing an intussusception. No one knows why this, this happens, okay, uh, most of the time. Sometimes it can be due to parasites, foreign bodies, infections, or neoplasia. But a lot of the time, it's just who knows why this happened. It happened. And uh, unfortunately, the part that's sucked into the other part of the bowel often becomes necrotic. It's a very painful condition. And none of the food can pass properly. And it's, it's very, it basically acts like a foreign body, right? Like nothing can pass. It's a blockage. Clinical signs are going to be vomiting, anorexia, depression, diarrhea. So things aren't going to be passing through. In this picture up here, you can see the intussusception right here. So this part of the bowel has actually sucked into this part of the bowel. We diagnose it by palpating. You can feel a sausage-like mass in the cranial abdomen, or you can do an ultrasound as well. How do we treat? Uh, we treat it surgically. So we actually will do a reduction or a resection of the necrotic bowel. So we'll um, pull this out. We may have to cut uh, uh, certain parts of the bowel because of it being necrotic and, and, de and dead. We'd want to do IV fluids because most likely they're going to be debilitated and dehydrated and, and some antibiotics. We'd want to fast for about 24 hours post-operative. That, that typically goes with any kind of GI surgery. We'll fast them for 24 hours. And then after that, we'll start them on a bland diet for a while just to allow that bowel to heal. Reoccurrence is uncommon. So once you fix it, hopefully that's it. And prognosis depends on the amount of dead bowel, right? How much dead tissue is going on in there? How long is it gone for? Very painful. Megacolon. It's very common in cats. Oh my gosh, we see this so often in cats, uh, especially in cats that are older and obese. Clinical signs, dehydrated, vomiting, straining to defecate, mucus and blood in stool, small hard feces, or maybe even liquid feces. The reason why you see liquid feces is because oftentimes with megacolon, you're gonna have a large hard rock of stool called the fecalith in that bowel. And uh, the liquid poop is gonna kind of make its way around this fecalith. And that's why you're gonna see some liquid feces. Diagnosis is fairly easy by palpating. You're going to palpate this huge, huge colon filled with very firm feces, that fecal if that I was telling you about. And an x-ray is going to show you a very large bowel as well. There's going to be a picture that you'll see in a second. How do we treat it? We give them stool softeners. We can give them enema. And um, we would rehydrate them which is going to soften the stool. And then sometimes even a manual evacuation. Although recent studies um, have been showing that you should never do a manual evacuation and that there's other better methods to take. But a lot of, a lot of times um, some doctors may feel it necessary to do a manual evacuation where you remove it rectally, these fecaliths. So diet, you'd want to increase the fiber and uh, feed raw canned pumpkin. A lot of the time when clients call um, saying that uh, my, my dog or cat's constipated, what do I do? And they don't necessarily want to come into a vet clinic. Uh, we can often tell them to go buy some canned pumpkin and uh, feed them that. And it actually acts as a stool softener and allows them to soften up the stool and pass their, their feces. Um, feed soft food because it's higher in water, so you're going to help with hydration, increase water intake, and um, this uh, Royal Canin fiber response actually is such an amazing diet for these megacolon um, cats, and a lot of the times just putting them on this diet alone will manage this condition, so you don't need to do all the drugs and everything, just this diet alone will often, cu uh, not cure it, but maintain it. Um, it's going to reoccur. Megacolon doesn't just go away uh, and you need to really, it's going to be a lifelong um, issue. You're going to have to maybe uh, take stool softeners for life or, these take, or put them on this special diet. It's going to be a lifelong condition. 
This right here is an x-ray of uh, animals with megacolon. Now, I mean, these bowels are just huge. Typically, a normal size bowel would probably be from here to here. That's how big it would be. That's it. This is like double or triple the size, and that's all filled with very rock hard feces. This here too. Now, this is um, the anus is right here. This is the rectum. And I mean, look how small the rectum is right here. And look how huge that is. There is no way that this feces is gonna pass through here. Very painful for these cats. Okay, so we've got we've done the GI from top to bottom. Now let's talk about the accessory structures and what can go wrong with them. So we can have liver disease. Um, the liver has many roles. It's actually estimated that it's got like 1,500 functions, which is blow my mind, amazing. Liver disease tends to be vague in the beginning stages because the liver is so resilient and regenerative. Um, but it, it, liver disease can be caused by drug or toxin induced. It could be, uh, so like if you're on lifelong drugs or whatever, it can cause liver disease. Infectious liver disease, so due to an infection. Feline um, hepatic lipidosis, so fatty liver disease. Neoplastic, so it could be tumors. Or it can be um, congenital issue, like a portosystemic shunt. So these shunts uh, are supposed to close at birth um, and help with the circulatory system, and sometimes it doesn't. So um, you have to be aware of that. Acute liver failure only occurs once 70 to 80% of the liver function has been lost. So unfortunately, by the time the animal comes in and we've realized that there's a liver issue going on, it's been going on for so long that about 70 to 80% of it has been lost. So very bad. Acute liver problems may be caused by the ingestion of toxins, including overdoses of certain of drugs like acetaminophen um, or even phenobarbital, which is the um, medication for epilepsy. Um, and antifungals as well can cause uh, liver disease. Clinical uh, long-term use of prescribed drugs will also cause chronic damage, so we always have to be careful. Clinical signs, anorexia, vomiting, maybe diarrhea, constipation, PUPD, blood in the urine or stool. They're going to be jaundice. That's a very good indicator of liver conditions. If you take a look at this poor guy right here, you can see the whites of his eyes and his ears are yellow. That is jaundice. Um, hypersalivation in cats and maybe even some central nervous system signs. We diagnose it because of the history of drug administration by their painful and large liver we would um, do some blood work, which is going to show the liver values that are going to be increased. Uh, we can do an x-ray or an ultrasound and a biopsy, uh, but not done if coagulopathy is suspected. So that means animals that have a difficulty clotting, we wouldn't do a biopsy because they're just not going to stop. Uh, the liver is quite vascular. So if you take a biopsy and there's a coagulopathy, it's that patient could bleed out. How do we treat it? If it's acetaminophen poisoning, there's actually an antidote that we can give. Uh, we induce vomiting if the toxin was ingested and it's safe to do so because some toxins you're not supposed to vomit back up because it can do more harm. We could give activated charcoal peros for a toxin that's not meant to be vomited. We could do IV fluids with vitamins added. Vitamin K therapy. So the patient becomes deficient because bile is required for vitamin K to be absorbed. Vitamin K deficiencies will prevent blood from clotting. So vitamin K in the diet helps with the normal clotting of blood. So um, for our body to be able to absorb the vitamin K from our diet, it needs bile. So if we have a deficiency in bile because of our liver disease, we're going to have a hard time absorbing that vitamin K. Therefore, we may have a coagulopathy. Remember the other slide I said, if there's a coagulopathy, we may not do that biopsy because we may bleed out. Well, that's why, because um, the liver is going to produce less bile. Therefore, less vitamin K is going to be absorbed. Therefore, we're going to have a problem clotting. And we would go on a low protein diet for life. Unfortunately, it's a progressive disease, and uh, but we just maintain quality of life until the end. Um, Anticonvulsants for epileptics, like the phenobarbital, steroids for pain or arthritis or inflammation. Um, these are all drugs, or, or long-term use of NSAIDs. These are all drugs that can cause liver disease. So anytime that we place a patient on these drugs long-term, we always have to do blood work, probably every six to 12 months to make sure that we're not damaging that liver. Um, how do we treat it? We could stop the medication. 
that's causing the liver disease, we do a low protein diet and we would force feed the patient if they're anorexic. So feline hepatic lipidosis, this is the most common hepatopathy seen in cats. It's called fatty liver. It affects adult obese cats. Cats cannot go long without eating. If they do, this happens, the hepatic lipidosis. Excessive amount of lipids accumulate in the liver cells and uh, further decreases cat's appetite, worsening the condition. Mechanism of lipid accumulation is unclear, um, but there's several theories. Early diagnosis and aggressive treatment is imperative and about 60% will, will recover. But again, 40% is a still pretty high fatal um, rate. So um, don't fast your cat. Cats aren't supposed to be fasted for any longer than 24 hours. Uh, if they are, then they can get hepatic lipidosis. So beware. Clinical signs is going to be anorexia, intermittent vomiting. Obese cats are going to just lose weight, often 25% of their body weight. <clears throat> They're going to be depressed and also icteric or jaundice. How do we diagnose? We do blood work. We may do um, an x-ray or an ultrasound where we'll see an enlarged liver, and we may even do a biopsy. How do we treat? It can be very intensive, costs a lot of money, unfortunately. IV fluids until electrolyte balance is restored. Nutritional support, often in a feeding tube because they're anorexic, like you see in this picture here. Uh, medications like an appetite stimulant, and we would recheck them. It's very long-term treatment for hepatic lipidosis. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, may cost a lot of money, so... <coughs> They need to have uh, an owner that's willing to go through all that with them. So we'd want to tell the client to avoid stress in obese cats. It may be a cause for fatty liver. Monitor the food intake. Avoid diet changes. So you also have to transition them very well to a new diet. Prevent obesity. And there's a guarded prognosis for these guys. These are just videos showing you different types of or, sorry, uh, feeding tubes. Very important to know. Portosystemic shunts. We, we, we mentioned this um, a, a few slides ago. This is a congenital abnormality in which the blood vessels connect the hepatic circulation to the systemic circulation, allowing some of the blood to bypass the liver so it doesn't get filtered. So um, toxins are going to build up in the bloodstream and cause hepatic encephalopathy. And here's a video here that I suggest you watch. Clinical signs usually develop at about six months of, six months of age, uh, often comes up at the time in, of neuter. I've seen this quite a few times actually before the neuter or spay. Um, usually in these little small breed dogs, they're going to show increased liver enzymes. And then we do a little bit more research and then we find out that they have a portosystemic shunt. Um, so obviously we would cancel the spay or neuter and we send them for a surgical ligation of the extra vessel. So it'll stop that extra vessel from shunting that blood. Um, very good prognosis if, if they go through with the surgery. Pancreatitis. Um, acute or chronic pancreatitis. It's believed to develop when digestive enzymes are activated within the gland, causing it to digest itself and resulting in inflammation and tissue damage. The, it's most, more common in obese patients. High fat diets often are to blame, can be associated with feline hepatic lipidosis as well. <clears throat> There's varying levels of severities, clinical signs, anorexia, vomiting, um, dehydration, fever, abdominal pain, depression, shock can develop in more advanced cases. I have seen quite a few advanced cases of pancreatitis and they are just miserable. It's, it's very sad to watch. Um, they're in a lot, a lot of pain. So we diagnose this by doing some blood work and also what's called a CPL or an FPL. CPL stands for canine pancreatic lipase or feline pancreatic lipase test, which is what you see up here. So this is going to tell you whether they are indeed positive for pancreatitis or negative for pancreatitis. How do we treat? We do a lot of IV fluids. Uh, we stop feeding them for about 24 hours. Recent recommendations actually suggest feeding sooner. Uh, pain management. 
Um, they're in so much pain that they often require fentanyl CRI or some kind of narcotic CRI. So constant rate infusion. That means they're, it, the drug is just constantly dripping into them with their IVs because they're in so much pain. Severe cases can require a plasma transfusion as well. When vomiting is stopped, feed a high carb diet. As patient improves, start a low fat diet. <clears throat> In clinic, we often see this around holidays because owners are going to feed um, table scraps and uh, like the, the turkey or the ham or the roast or bacon, causing a drastic increase in the animal's fat intake and resulting in acute pancreatitis. So it's just very important that owners know not to feed uh, the table scraps. And during the holidays, when you have people over, just uh, let everyone be aware to not do that. <clears throat> 